Uh, it is a great pleasure to be here in Bangkok. And uh, although it's my first time, and due to in light of the recent events, I must admit that uh, I had some second thoughts. Now that I've arrived here, I feel very safe and very well, warmly welcomed. So it is a, a great opportunity for me to see Bangkok. Uh, before I begin, ladies and gentlemen, I would also like to thank you for attending this um, workshop. I think that it is a wonderful uh, educational initiative. And uh, uh, Global uh, Fertility Academy needs to be commented on this initiative and all the educational support that has been providing to us. Uh, I think that all of the faculty uh, wants and would actually aim it ma in making this workshop as educational and as much of a learning experience for everyone. So uh, I would invite you to participate and uh, share your experiences and offer feedback as often as you think you need to. I would also like to thank, of course, the, pro the program chair for the invitation, GFA, and uh, Merck Serono for their logistical support. And I would like to personally thank Sherman and Anne from the organizers that uh, have uh, been um, helping us organize this whole thing for quite a long time now. So uh, with no further ado, I would like to start this presentation by addressing a couple of um, fields in ovarian stimulation that we think that they are highly, highly uh, important and quite clinically relevant for the everyday physician. So uh, we will be discussing about papers and posters that were presented during this year's ESHRAM annual meeting in Lisbon. For those of you who you know, weren't there because you couldn't make it or were too busy or because you weren't able to actually attend all the different uh, sessions, I think this is a very good summary of uh, some very, very interesting papers that we have chosen for you. So uh, starting, we will be uh, addressing or we will be looking at two specific fields. The first one is the management of patients uh, that are at high risk for OHSS. And this is something that it has become quite, quite relevant and quite popular in terms of um, publications and discussion during the, uh, you know, the recent years. The reason is because we have reached a point where we are quite good at what we do in terms of uh, efficacy, but what we should try and do is improve the safety meaning that we should try and keep our patients safe. So the, out, the outline of this presentation includes a nice plenary um, lecture that was given by Nikos Polizos from Brussels. Uh, we will also be discussing about a paper presented by Professor Paul De Vuy, one of the most prominent clinical researchers of our times in IVF. We will be looking at one big RCT that compared fixed day six antagonist protocols with long generate agonist protocols in an unselected population, a pragmatic RCT, as the authors discussed, with interesting results. And we will also be looking at a very interesting concept coming from Greece, my hometown, my home, my home uh, country, and uh, also my hometown, Thessaloniki, uh, which, uh, in which the authors try to prevent OHSS by administering uh, double the dose of generate antagonist. The next field that we're going to address is the management of poor ovarian response, which I know that, is you know that probably is the biggest therapeutic challenge out there. And we will be looking at papers that um, uh, addressed the addition of recombinant LAs uh, during, folli during uh, the follicular phase. Uh, we will be looking also into a nice presentation, a nice poster from um, Japan who explored and presented results regarding the consecutive stimulation during the same menstrual cycle in women with diminished ovarian reserve. And lastly, we will also be looking at some interesting data coming from Spain regarding how the use of growth hormone, which has been suggested to improve pregnancy rates in poor responders, might be uh, associated or a potential mechanism could be through uh, increasing euploidy rates. So starting with the first uh, part of uh, this uh, presentation, uh, the management of OHSS risk uh, can be done with, uh, you know, various methods have been proposed and I'm sure that many of you have completely different methods of uh, actually identifying or addressing this uh, need. So Nikos Polizos from Brussels gave a nice overview of what the literature says and where we are. And uh, his goal during that presentation was to uh, see whether we are at that stage nowadays where we can actually uh, aim at an OHSS free clinic. This is a concept introduced, uh, you know, uh, I think three to four years ago. And the reason is because OHSS, as you know, is 
probably one of the most serious complications of IVF and can be potentially lethal. Uh, most registries or most uh, big observational studies actually have uh, uh, calculated the risk to be around 0 0.5, 0 0.3 percent, which is not great, uh, which is not that uh, high for severe OHSS. But if you imagine that patients come to have a baby and they might end up in the ICU, then that is clinically significant. And at the same time, within RCTs, where things are much more controlled and much more standardized, that risk for severe OHSS could, risk, could uh, reach uh, numbers up to 3 percent. So I think that we should try and minimize uh, at least, if not eliminate, the occurrence of severe OHSS. And this is what this study has, uh, this uh, paper or this presentation has tried to explore by looking at what would be the potential means that we have in our armamentarium. So uh, nowadays we have a couple of things that actually make this thing uh, more uh, feasible. First of all, the introduction of generic antagonists, the use of generic agonists to trigger final oocyte maturation, which is only feasible in the context of a generate antagonist cycle. And of course, the freeze all policy, which completely or almost completely eliminates the risk of uh, severe, late severe OHSS. So the first slide is regarding the use of generate antagonists. And I would like to ask you, can you please just by raising your hands, how many of you have a generate antagonist protocol as a first line protocol in your everyday practice. Okay. I would say that would probably around 20 to 25 percent. Those that actually said that they don't have that, do you, feel, do you think it's less efficacious? If so, please raise your hands. Do you think that the antagonist protocol is not as, uh, uh, does not result in you know, the pregnancy rates that agonist protocols result in. That's why you don't have it as a first line uh, treatment for your patients. No. Do you think it's less safe? Do you think that by administering antagonists is less safe? Raise your arms if you think that it's less safe. You think it's less safe. Okay. So, when the antagonists were introduced, I know that I was around, there was a lot of skepticism by the physicians regarding whether they're actually useful or not, and whether at the same time they introduced a completely different concept of how the cycle and follicular phase could be managed, but there was a lot of skepticism on whether they actually result in uh, comparable pregnancy rates. The first couple of systematic reviews actually said that no, if you use GNR as antagonist, then you have lower chances of a clinical or ongoing pregnancy rate. Then in 2006, my good friend Stratus Kolibianakis published a systematic review and meta-analysis which said that when you actually use GNR as antagonist cycles, there is no statistically significant difference in terms of live birth rates, and at the same time, you almost half the risk of severe OHSS or of hospitalization due OHSS. So that completely overturned, overturned things. Interestingly, at the same time, the Cochrane collaboration, their meta-analysis was not actually sharing the same uh, enthusiasm or the same views regarding the efficacy of generic antagonists. Nowadays, where is the current state of evidence? Even the Cochrane collaboration uh, is now accepting that there is no difference in terms of uh, live birth rates or ongoing pregnancy rates between antagonists and agonists, and at the same time that generate antagonist protocols are significantly more, um, efficacious, uh, more um, are significantly safer in terms that they almost half or even more the risk of severe OHSS. So having generate antagonists and using generate antagonists is actually a, more, a safer uh, mode of, of stimulating our patients in terms of OHSS. At the same time, an extra benefit of using generate antagonists in order to uh, suppress premature uh, luteinization during ovarian uh, stimulation is the fact that now we can actually use GnRH agonists to trigger our patients. That was not feasible when we were down-regulating uh, or when we are down-regulating our patients with a long GnRH agonist protocol, but in the GnRH antagonist protocol, given the rapid recovery of the pituitary in the hypothalamus, we can actually do that. However, the first studies that came out actually suggested that if we trigger with a generate agonist, yes, we have a significant benefit in terms of OHSS rate, the uh, 
the occurrence uh, risk of the risk of OHSS is significantly reduced. However, it appears that pregnancy rates are also significantly reduced as well. So that put things, uh, you know, at hold for uh, many of the, of the physicians. However, recently there has been an intense effort in order to try and develop a protocol of luteal phase support that would make uh, generates agonist triggering and fresh transfer of embryos feasible. So this is a publication by Peter Humaydan from Denmark in which he reviewed all the papers that have been so far published by using a, a modified luteal phase support for agonist trigger cycles. And what he saw is that you could actually see, depending of course on the modification of the luteal phase, you could actually see patients uh, that, that their OHSS risk would decrease, but at the same time they would maintain their uh, chances of pregnancy rates. And by modified risk and by modified luteal phase support, there are many different modifications. So Peter Humaydan uh, is a big advocate of uh, giving bolus low doses of ACG. There are also uh, other uh, modalities at multiple doses of recombinant LH, 300 units every second day, or multiple doses of generate agonist or intramuscular progesterone with oral or transdermal estradiol. So these are uh, the data are there, however, we still need more evidence, but this shows that um, it might be actually feasible to have a fresh embryo transfer after an agonist trigger uh, uh, cycle. My question to you right now would be, would you be comfortable in having a fresh transfer after an agonist triggering, uh, uh, an agonist triggered cycle? Can you please raise your arms, those that will actually do it? You do it? May I ask? What, what, what is the mode or what is the, the method of luteal phase support that you offer to your patients? You give ACG. So you follow the Peter Humaydan idea. Okay. And have you witnessed uh, comparable pregnancy rates? Yeah. Do you think, have you witnessed also ACG uh, or OHSS occurrence? Yeah. So that is. Uh, quite, quite similar to the overall experience. Whenever I discuss this protocol, most of uh, uh, our colleagues would say that indeed uh, the OHSS rate is reduced substantially, however, it's still there. So yes, uh, modified luteal phase support could probably be associated with a significant reduction in OHSS rates. However, uh, 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 but however, OHSS are not eliminated. Using the freezel strategy, of course, when you, act, when you trigger someone with agonist, you don't have to worry about that because then the risk of severe OHSS is almost eliminated. I'm sure you know that only, I think, five or six case reports have been reported so far with uh, severe OHSS after agonist triggering. So uh, summarizing this presentation, the goal of IVF should not only be an increase in pregnancy rates, we should just keep our patients safe at the same time. Having antagonists, uh, being able to trigger them with agonist and at the same time freezing all is a, you know, are important measures that we can take in order to protect our patients from severe OHSS. Coming to the next presentation, this was a presentation by Bolte Rui and uh, the reason he gave this presentation because is, as we said OHSS is a significant problem and we tend to classify our patients at high risk or low risk for OHSS. However, whether these two, you know, uh, cohorts of patients actually differ in terms of pregnancy rates, OHSS rates, IVF failure rates, has not yet been properly explored. And that was the aim of the current publication, of the current paper. So in order to achieve that, the authors performed a retrospective analysis from data coming from the ENGAGE trial, which is one of the largest that has ever been performed in reproductive medicine. The ENGAGE trial was an RCT evaluating the efficacy of corifolitropin versus daily recombinant FSH administration. And they classified the population in those at high risk, which were those that had 19 or more follicles equal of, uh, of a mean diameter of uh, 11 or more uh, millimeters, and non-high risk, those that had less than 19 follicles. Coming to the results, we can see that uh, almost 26% of that population was risked as being at high risk, was uh, rated as being at high risk for severe OHSS. 
Unfortunately, uh, only a fraction of those actually uh, developed a severe OHSS, around 1.7. And uh, between corifolitropin and daily recombinant FSAs, the results were actually comparable. Uh, here we can see uh, how, uh, what was the prevalence or what was the occurrence of OHSS depending on whether you had been pre-labeled as being as high risk or low risk. And of course, as you can imagine, uh, patients that were at high risk had significantly higher chances of actually developing severe OHSS than patients that had been labeled as low risk. And this is what anyone would expect, and that means that the threshold that we have set for you know, uh, differentiating between these two categories is actually working. So 8.3 in the corifolitropin versus 2.1, 5.3 in the recombinant FSH versus 2. In every case, significant difference between the low and the high risk groups. So they used this specific number. Do you, one question I would like to ask to you, which I think is very interesting, do you use estradiol in order to assess whether a patient is at risk of high OHSS on the day of ACG? Do you use follicles? Do you use both? How many, you use, how, how many of you use just estradiol to assess uh, the risk of someone being uh, of having OHSS. Please raise your hands. Is anyone using just estradiol? No. How many use both estradiol and follicles? And do you have a preset cutoff? How many of you have actually preset cutoffs that, and have you developed them in clinic or is it, are they based on publication in the literature? How many have developed them in clinic by looking at the databases? Okay, can you share what, what's the cutoff in terms of estradiol that you're using in your clinic? Sorry, my hearing. 2,500 picomoles or pic picograms, picograms. And in terms of follicles or oocytes? Yes, if we found more than 20 in more, my clinic. More than 20 follicles or yes. oocytes? Uh, follicles. Follicles. And more than 11, what's the size of the follicles you measure? Everything that's more or equal to 11 millimeters? Yes, more than 11. More than 11. And if you have one or the other, does that patient still qualify as being at high risk? If you only have the estradiol uh, you know, criterion fulfilled, would you still consider that patient, or you have to have both? We use both of criteria. Okay, all right. So it's quite, quite interesting because uh, there is a big discussion on whether estradiol is uh, more predictive or follicles, and it appears based on some publications that are actually coming that probably the number of follicles is a stronger predictor than estradiol, and I'm happy to discuss why that is uh, uh, with you if you would like to have more information. So uh, coming back to the presentation of Paul de Rui, there was a significant risk. However, there was no significant difference in terms of clinical pregnancy rates, viable pregnancy rates, and live birth rates. You might see that there is a numerical advantage in the patients or in the groups that were characterized as at high risk of, for OHSS, but this never reached statistical significance. The conclusions from this paper uh, by the authors was that in women undergoing ovarian stimulation with corifolitropin and recombinant FSH in a generated antagonist protocol, uh, having this classification actually can differentiate or can properly classify the patients that will actually experience severe OHSS or not. And the pregnancy rates seem to be comparable. Some people might think that those small jumps in pregnancy rates uh, might actually be significant if we had a larger sample size, and I won't disagree with you, that's a fair assumption. However, whether we should take this into account or whether uh, we should uh, focus on that and none of the fact that these patients had significant OHSS, uh, significant more OHSS, that's another discussion. I think that the overall benefit risk profile is in favor of not having excessive response, especially when you're transferring fresh. So the third study was about agonist versus antagonist. This is, as we said earlier, a huge you know, discussion, a huge debate that has been going on for years and years. There are still many physicians that are not convinced that antagonists are good enough. So uh, these authors wanted actually to see whether outside of the context of a you know, very strictly organized RCT, by using a more pragmatic approach, uh, you could see any differences between just two protocols, the fixed day six antagonist protocol and the long generates agonist. So the two gold standards. In order to do that, they, they addressed and they actually recruited all the patients that, ha that, didn't, that hadn't reached her, their 40th birthday. 
That was, of course, a randomized trial. The initial starting dose of FSH was based on the age, 150 over 225, depending on where you were more or less than or less or more than 36. And of course, there were subjective and uh, objective parameters of OHSS measured at various times because that was their main uh, outcome. They wanted to see whether indeed antagonist offers a benefit in terms of OHSS rates. So, of course, there was no baseline differences, and even though there were, this is an RCT, so it wouldn't make any difference. In terms of the results, you can see what we have also seen in the meta-analysis, and that is that, excuse me, that is that there is significantly higher dose of recombinant FSH in the long generate agonist, that we also have significantly higher day, uh, longer duration of ovarian stimulation in order to fulfill the criteria, and the number of eggs is also significantly increased. And these, all these findings are compatible with the meta-analysis both by Cochrane and both by, you know, Stratus Colibianakis. In terms of number of embryos transferred, freezing of embryos, the percentage, and the number of embryos that we could actually freeze, these uh, researchers did not observe any difference between those two, uh, uh, those two uh, groups. In terms of clinical pregnancy rates and live birth rates or go and ongoing pregnancy rates, no difference regarding on whether the analysis was done by, per ITT, per intention to treat, per randomized patient, per started cycle, or per ET. So overall comparable results. In terms of their main outcome measure, which was the risk of severe OHSS, they concluded that it was indeed significantly reduced in patients that were receiving antagonists. You can see here that uh, in patients that almost in almost every case, uh, every case apart from the hospital admission, which was not significant, there was almost a doubling of the effect. So using the antagonist, half the chances of uh, having to modify your treatment or your management based on uh, the high risk of OHSS, to have to be examined by a physician due to suspected OHSS, to have to cancel the cycle, to have to do uh, you know, a skittis puncture, and also the occurrence of severe OHSS per se. So from this trial, it was concluded that now we have more evidence by you know, analyzing more than 1,000 patients in a single multicenter RCT from Denmark that indeed uh, antagonist protocols in women less than 40 appear to uh, result in or Actually, to be more specific, it's the fixed day six antagonist protocol versus the long agonist that appear to be comparable in terms of efficacy, and at the same time, antagonist protocols are much, much safer. So I hope that, you know, after seeing those evidence as well, you would think again on whether the antagonist protocols and whether the specific, specifically the fixed day six offers some additional safety for your patient and your patients, and you might want to consider such protocols, especially when you have patients that have been labeled as being as at high risk for HSS. So the last part of this, uh, uh, of, uh, this first section regarding the modification of management in order to address patients at high risk for HSS uh, is uh, one nice poster with uh, a relatively novel idea. It has been presented before, but this is the first time that it has actually been tested uh, in the context of a RCT trial on how to reduce the occurrence of severe uh, early OHSS by just doubling the GnRH antagonist dose. So in this study, uh, that was the whole concept, and the reason for that is because although, as we just discussed, in antagonist cycles you always have uh, the option of doing agonist freezing, uh, agonist uh, triggering, and then freezing all, there still are some patients that would like to go forward with uh, a fresh embryo transfer. So in order to address that, some uh, researchers have tried to identify or to find alternative measures of actually um, decreasing the risk of OHSS. So in this single sender double blind randomized controlled trial involving more than uh, 194 patients, uh, on the day prior to ACG, patients were randomized to either receive the standard dose of uh, uh, antagonist or to receive double dose of the antagonist but split in two, uh, tw 12 hours apart. So instead of just administering uh, the morning dose of antagonist, as most would do, they would also have the patient have a second dose 12 hours after the first uh, dose, and at the same time, they would lower the dose of recombinant FSH to 100 units for, the next, uh, for, for that day. 
the primary at, uh, endpoints <coughs> were the occurrence of severe early OHSS, and of course they also addressed uh, rel you know, various secondary uh, endpoints. There were no differences in terms of um, age, recombinant FSH, number of OHSS retrieved, number of M2O sites, endometrial thickness between the two groups. And yes, that's what, something that you would expect given the fact that randomization occurred. Thank you. That randomization occurred at, uh, on the day prior to ACG. So even if there were any differences, randomization worked, so it equally uh, uh, placed uh, the two groups. In terms of the results that these researchers observed, uh, you, you could see here that the severe early onset OHSS was significantly reduced. The numbers are, they observed zero out of 97 patients of severe uh, OHSS uh, in group A, which was the one with a double generic antagonist, where they observed 12 out of 97 in the other group. 12 out, out, out of 97 probably equals to around 12.5%. So that means that this is quite, quite high. These patients were at you know, significantly high risk of OHSS. There were no differences in all the other parameters assessed, and of course no differences in the pregnancy rate per cycle and the pregnancy rate per embryo transfer, absolutely comparable pregnancy rates. So they also wanted to look on the hormonal results after doing this modification on the, in the ovarian stimulation. And as one would expect, and I think you would agree with me, the estradiol on allocation, which was the day prior to ACG, had a certain value, but, and they were comparable. On the day of ACG, though, after having received double uh, antagonist or uh, the ordinary dose, there was significantly difference in terms of the value of estradiol, and it was significantly reduced, and the same applied for LAs and progesterone. Does anyone have an idea why this might have happened? Why do you think doubling the dose of antagonist might have affected the hormonal dy dynamics or kinetics on the next day? Does just one dose of antagonist can have such a big impact on uh, the hormonal dynamics? Well, based on reproductive physiology and on the fact that the antagonists do not stay there for, you know, they are not, it's not a long GnRH agonist down regulation, so there are fluctuations, and within 12 hours uh, the effect it starts to minimize. It's quite, quite reasonable to think that having less of an LH drive during that early morning of the day of ACG actually can give you significantly less steroidogenic stimulus to the granulosa cells of the follicles, and that's why these values are observed. And this is quite compatible to what we have observed when we're doing similar experiments in the context of clinical trials. So based on this Small RCT with interesting findings that, uh, though, we can say that administration of a double dose generous antagonist on the day before ACD trigger might be beneficial and might offer an alternative tool for prevention of severe OHSS in uh, patients at high risk while at the same time maintaining high pregnancy rates. Of course, needless to say that we need more evidence. This is just an RCT, a small RCT for a single, from a single center. We need this concept to be verified, but it is actually quite, quite interesting to see those results. So now we would like to go forward with the second part of this presentation, which is an equally challenging and intriguing part, how to manage poor ovarian response. Does anyone here in the room think that he has the magic portion? He, he has the secret. He knows how to manage poor ovarian response. If you do, please raise your hands, and I would be happy to you know, invite you to come here and share your experiences. Uh, I come from the Thessaloniki group. This is where my original uh, training and research was done, and we have a lot of poor responders, many poor responders, and not just poor responders, probably the worst you know, end of the spectrum of school responders. We have constantly trying to assess different uh, modalities. Unfortunately, so far, we haven't been able to identify clearly something that, you know, is the right answer for treating poor responders. And I'm sure that this is something that you have also, uh, you know, come to, you know, it's the conclusion you have also come to with your clinical experience. So, there is an ongoing need for finding something that would, you know, just do the trick. And this is what uh, 
these authors try to do. There is an ongoing debate on whether recombinant and late supplementation in these patients and poor respond poorly responding patients can improve their results. Uh, I was fortunate enough to be uh, a co-author uh, in one of the most recent meta-analyses that have been published addressing this issue, where we demonstrated that actually recombinant LAIDs is associated in the poor responders with an increase in clinical pregnancy rates of up to 30%, a relative increase that is, of course. However, in that same publication, we noted the extreme heterogeneity between the studies, which actually makes you a bit more reserved regarding the result. So this study coming from India tried to address the same concept and to do that they used a randomized design. They identified, so their population was not patients that had already demonstrated the previous poor response, but they were prospective or expected poor responders based on AMH or based on low AFC count. And women received, uh, as you can see here, ovarian stimulation with recombinant FSAs in both groups and recombinant LAs from day six of stimulation, 75 units. And uh, the results were analyzed using uh, pregnancy rates as a primary outcome measure and, of course, looking at uh, other aspects of stimulation and uh, re the results. So these are uh, the initial uh, results, as you can see, no differences in the baseline variables, as would expected for an RCT. The days of stimulation, interestingly, there was a marginally statistically significant result uh, in favor of adding recombinant LAs, about 0 0.8 days. Whether that's also statistically significant, that's something that I'll let you decide. Uh, there was no difference, uh, of course, in recombinant FSH and stradiol on the day of ACG. In terms of X retrieved, they, you know, they had substantially more eggs retrieved in patients that received recombinant LH, and not just that. You can see here, and that's probably something that I would like you to consider, that these were expected poor responders, but even those that just got recombinant FSH still produced on average 5.3. Whether that would satisfy the criteria for poor ovarian response, I'm not quite sure. So when you're actually using expected ovarian, expected poor response, you might have a completely different population to test, your, um, to test your intervention. Coming to the clinically significant or to the primary outcome measures, we can see that there was no difference in terms of fertilization rates. Interestingly enough, there was a significant difference in favor of recombinant LH in the uh, the cleavage rates, there was no difference in the plastic formation, blastulation rate was significantly increased, and they also observed differences in terms of endometrial thickness and also in terms of endometrial grading, which is something, again, that's open for discussion given the subjectivity that might be involved there. In terms of clinical pregnancy rates, the data that were presented during ESHA where that is, there is actually a statistically significant difference in clinical pregnancy rate and also a statistically significant difference in implantation rate. However, as you, some of you might have already noticed, uh, it is, and for those of us that are into or are actually um, trying to uh, run and design clinical trials, uh, it is quite, quite interesting how clinical pregnancy rates, and when I saw that presentation, I was quite baffled, how a difference of 28.6 to 38.1, just 10% difference, could lead to such a statistically significant result by using only this amount, you know, this number of patients. So I actually redid, I actually re, uh, redid, redid the statistics myself and there is no, statistic, no, no significant difference. So the actual p-value, if you yourselves do a Fisher's exact test, is 0 0.488. So this is incorrect. At the same time, implantation rate also is incorrect, and it, it is not just that this p-value here is incorrect, it's also the fact that it has been you know, incorrectly calculated, because when you have a randomized controlled trial, all your results should be analyzed per randomized patient, because that's the unit of analysis. If you change that and you ag aggregate all the embryos that were transferred and all the sacs, then you completely violate this principle. So this is something, this is a common mistake that we see in the literature. I'm a reviewer and I'm currently uh, also the statistical editor for human reproduction, and I have to correct these things probably in more than half of the papers we receive. 
So based on these results, the authors concluded that the use of recombinant LAs in the, molecular, in the mid follicular phase results in better implantation rates following blastocyst transfer in antagonist cycles and better clinical pregnancy rates. But for the reasons I just discussed with you, I would say that probably the data support, the data presented, the actual data, not the statistical uh, tests, do not support such a statement. It does not mean that the results might not actually hold true, but based on this experiment, we cannot say that a significant difference was demonstrated. The next uh, interesting study comes from Japan, uh, which is uh, about trying to fit in two oocyte retrievals within one menstrual cycle. This is an interesting concept that has been used in the past and has been suggested also, I know some Chinese groups have uh, presented data. And it's quite, quite interesting because it completely violates what we used to know regarding the basic physiology of the menstrual cycle. When I started my training, I remember my mentors and my professors saying, no, you have to wait for inhibin A to go down in order to you know, start stimulation and all that. But now we can see that based on the new concepts, that might actually be false. The follicular waves are not, are, sort of independent on how they come. And if they find sufficient uh, FSH drive, they might develop uh, not necessarily uh, uh, you know, in sync with the endometrium. So trying to evaluate whether you know, fitting two cycles with two uh, stimulation cycles within uh, you know, a menstrual cycle would be beneficial was the aim of this study. And it was a prospective clinical trial in a small sample of patients, 21, uh, 21, cyc 21 cycles in 20 patients. And uh, you know, they, the main outcome measure was to see in how many cycles they actually had success of vitrifying an embryo. So their results actually show that they managed to increase the overall success rate of the method by 80%. And the reason for that is because just by, excuse me, just by doing or attempting cryopreservation from follicular phase stimulated cycles, they got three cycles with vitrified embryos. When they did both, they had two cycles, and they had another, cy another four cycles that actually were initiated during the luteal phase and produced vitri embryos that were able to vitrify. So according to the um, researchers, in this very, very small sample, you can see a significant benefit. At the same time, a concern would be, yes, we can get some embryos, but are these embryos, are these eggs actually uh, of the same uh, capacity? In order to test that, because that was a, pro uh, a program of e embryo banking, they looked at uh, the uh, luteal, uh, they looked at the uh, IV fertilization, at the grading of the embryos, and overall they were comparable. So no differences you know, in the eggs and in the number in the, or in the quality of the embryos obtained if they come from follicular phase or luteal phase. And this is something quite, quite significant. May I ask prior to uh, closing this session, how many of you have tried or how many of you have had experiences with luteal phase uh, oocyte collections? Is there anyone here that actually has done it or is using it currently as a strategy? Anyone? Maybe back there where I cannot see. Okay, I will share a story which happened three years ago just prior to my move to Australia. We had a patient in our clinic, she was 38 and she came with premature ovarian insufficiency, premature ovarian failure. She had, uh, it is quite a story, she was 38, overall well, never had conceived, uh, she was in a permanent relationship. For a year, she had some menstrual um, uh, you know, disorders, in meaning that she had some areomenorrhea. Uh, she had visited some general gynecologists, some of which had just prescribed the pill. No one had tested her ovarian reserve. So when she came to us, she, she had discontinued the pill and she didn't have a period for a couple of months. So she came to us, we did an AMH, it was almost undetectable, less than 1.1. She had an FSH of 37, almost you know, menopausal uh, hormonal characteristics or perimenopausal hormonal characteristics. We counseled her about you know, the risks. She was very eager to fall pregnant. We told her that the chances of falling pregnancy or even obtaining anything would be quite, quite low. But then she went into a you know, monthly uh, um, monitoring program. About, I think, two months ago, she came back and during that cycle, for, because Apparently, there was a, a cohort, a wave of follicles coming because this is what happens during the premenopausal period. Uh, 
she had an, an FSH, a basal FSH of 9.2. So we decided that it might be a good idea to stimulate her. So we hit her heart with 450 units, antagonist protocol. We managed uh, to see two follicles. 117 and one around 14 on the day of HCG. We triggered her, we went. Uh, she had around 786, uh, I think, um, it was her picograms, was her estradiol. We went in, did a pickup, we got nothing. Both were cystic, not even granulosa cells, nothing. So she was really disappointed, devastated. We had, you know, we did counseling. About three to four days later, she called the nurses and she said, uh, she is a highly educated person that I feel that my left ovary now, because those two follicles had developed in her right ovary, my left ovary now is active. Of course, you know, at first we said, probably it's just you, you're thinking, we understand that you're very, she has been quite stressful, uh, but she was insisting. So we said, if you keep having these symptoms, come two or three days later just to have a blood. So uh, she came and uh, we had a scan and a blood, and there was actually one follicle 13 millimeters developing in her right ovary. And that was around five days post-retrieval. We did estradiol, which was around 200, uh, 175 picograms per ml, but we weren't quite sure whether that was originating from the follicle or whether that was just because uh, the, her estradiol levels post-ACG had not yet gone down. However, we decided to go forward. So what we did is we started giving her antagonist and topped up with just 75 units of recombinant FSH. Uh, you know, just to, to make a long story, story short, we had a, a pickup, I think five days later, at 19 millimeters. We got one egg and we managed to fertilize it and vitrify it at the 2 p.m. stage. And uh, she's still actually trying to do that, so she's, she's still trying to store embryos, and she hasn't been very successful. I think we may have managed to, to get one more egg with a similar uh, protocol in the luteal phase. And that was the first time where we actually, even ourselves, challenged the concept of should we start or should we ignore patients saying that we have symptoms during the luteal phase. And that has changed our practice. So sometimes, yes, we have also tried doing luteal phase stimulation. So it might you know, be worth uh, looking into that as well. So the last presentation, uh, which I would like to discuss with you, is a, a poster uh, from Spain in which the authors try to evaluate whether there is any uh, evidence that human growth hormone might be associated with euploidy rates. So in order to do that, uh, they uh, looked at patients that uh, uh, had been, uh, uh, actually they performed a prospective study, a randomized study, which was ho however a crossover study, meaning these patients were again doing cryo, embryo cryobanking. So they randomized these patients in their center to either have growth hormone pretreatment for five weeks or not have uh, growth hormone pretreated randomly. So whether it would be the first or the second cycle, it was randomized. Uh, so uh, up after that, of course, if they retrieved any embryos, they did PGS uh, on day five, and uh, using RA, uh, CGH, they evaluated their euploidy rates. So based on the results, uh, they could observe that there was a significant difference in, uh, in terms of the serum estradiol. So patients, or the cycles actually, not patients, the cycles in which a growth hormone had been used had higher estradiol on the day of ACG. Uh, the number of oocytes retrieved blastocyst rate and top quality blast and, and blastocyst rate was uh, comparable. The top quality blastocyst rate was marginally significantly different, so 0 0.04. And what's impressive is, sorry, look at this, the euploid blastocyst rate. This is the rate per patient. So in the cycles that they actually had growth hormone, almost one out of three uh, embryos that were biopsied was euploid, whereas in the case of no human growth hormone, that was less than 4%, so significant difference. Implantation rate uh, uh, was marginally significant, and pregnancy rate, of course, that is per embryo transferred, and that's why you can see with such low euploid blastocyst rates, a pregnancy rate of 23.3, because those numbers are per patients that were actually, uh, that had actually transferred an embryo, uh, were also significantly higher in human growth hormone uh, cycles. So based on that, uh, the authors concluded that the evidence, the clinical evidence from RCTs that human growth hormone might help poor responders is out there. This offers a plausible mechanism by which you know, this might happen. So far, we were 
we, we thought that it's just the number of embryos, but it actually might be the euploidy of the eggs as well, or uh, you know, the, uh, the fact that you have a better embryo quality. So uh, that, you know, that made them support that it could be a very, uh, a very good uh, adjuvant for the treatment of poor responders. So summarizing, and these are the two final slides, uh, we have looked at new concepts that were discussed or even a summary of the available measures that we have in order to manage patients at high risk for OHSS. And we've looked at uh, a plenary session by Nikos Polizos where he just said that nowadays it might be feasible to have an OHSS free clinic by using antagonist, doing agonist triggering and freezing all embryos. We've looked at the De Vruy paper where they saw whether patients classified at high risk or low risk for OHSS have different outcomes. And indeed, clinical pregnancy rates or live birth rates, viable pregnancy rates were not different. However, there was a difference uh, in um, OHSS rate, as it would be expected. We also look at that big RCT coming from Denmark, more than a thousand patients, unselected population, a pragmatic trial, not like the ones that for the pharma industries do, where you have many, many, you know, selection criteria, exclusion criteria, less than 36, where it was shown that daily recombinant, uh, that the, the uh, that, uh, excuse me, that the generates antagonist uh, day six, fixed day six protocol uh, results in comparable live birth rates, ongoing pregnancy rates with the long generates agonist, but at the same time, it's associated with significantly reduced OHSS rates. And we also looked at that poster from Ravenos, that interesting R R RCT that supported that actually doubling the antagonist on the day prior to HCG might actually prevent uh, a few cases or more cases than uh, of severe early uh, onset OHSS. In terms of managing poor ovarian responders, we saw that study from India, uh, from uh, Dr. Chimote et al., where it was supported based on what was presented that recombinant LH is beneficial. It is that study, may I remind you, where we looked again at the numbers and it appears that there is no, statistically, there is no statistical significance, so have that in mind. Uh, but as previously said, we have other studies as well that support the concept and there is a big meta-analysis that uh, recombinant LH might be beneficial in, in poor responders. We had the study from uh, Japan that we just talked about, the two consecutive cycles, and we had the human growth uh, hormone study in which it was shown that in cycles that have human growth hormone, even in the same patients, you, you have significantly more euploid embryos um, uh, you know, after st stimulation. And with that, I would like to thank you for your attention. I know it's been a long session. I hope you have you know, learned or gained something out of it, and I would you know, certainly wel uh, welcome any questions or any feedback that you might have. Thank you.